Well, bonjour, Anin, everybody. Uh, what that means is welcome, my friends. Um, welcome to our Native American Celebration Day. And uh, uh, one thing I wanted to say is Native Americans, uh, the circle is sacred to Native Americans and everything within that circle to include Grandmother Earth, Grandfather Sky, Four Winds, the Four Directions, our family, our friends, our work, everything is within that circle. So when I say welcome all my relations to our Native American Celebration Day event, what that means is everybody that's out there that's joining us or just in general have created little circles within the big circle. And those circles might include your professional lives, your personal lives, your friends, your families, your you know uh, partners that we work with, the, the customers we serve. Those are all little circles within the big circle of life. So that's how we're all tied together, that we're all relations. And that's why I say, welcome all my relations. The second part of that is our, in that first opening statement. And that means that since we are all related, this is not my celebration day. This is not your celebration day. It's everybody's celebration day. And I welcome you all to join us. A little bit of history, uh, first of all, for those that don't know me, I'm Kenneth, Ken, Kenneth J. Lynch. I'm a proud member of the Red Cliff uh, Band of Chippewa Indians from Red Cliff, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm Loon Clan, which means uh, I come from the government side of my tribe. And I have a bear totem or spirit animal, which means that I'm uh, a healer, a protector, a provider for the family and the tribe. So that's a little bit of my history. The history of Native American Celebration Day for me is something that, uh, well, first of all, I've been sharing Native American culture since I was about seven. That's when I first had the aha moment. And I'll tell you a little story. The story starts uh, of my family living in Douglas, Arizona. Um, I have four brothers, mother, father, and neighbors that moved in next to us were a Navajo family. That family consisted of uh, Tinker uh, Patterson, who was the baby. The daughter was Maxine, his son-in-law, um, Stan Patterson, and who lived with him was grandmother, um, grandma they called her, and her name was Maggie Left Hand. Maggie Left Hand was 80, 80 plus years old at the time when we met her, and she's the one that made this rug behind me. Um, when we started to become better friends with him, I made my mother and father, we would play on the yard and watch grandma in the backyard. Um, grandma found out my father was a jeweler. So she wanted to have a piece of his jewelry and she offered up a rug in exchange. So they were bartering at the time. When my father, he worked for weeks on this piece of jewelry and this thing was about that big and it was all silver turquoise um, with different silver inlay on it. It was beautiful. And he polished it for three days. You could shave in that thing. When grandmother was done a few weeks later with a rug, and hopefully you can see this, I have a picture of grandmother. This is grandma, Maggie left hand, making the rug. So anyway, when they were both completed with their projects, they met and they finished the deal. And a couple of days later, they were both extremely happy with the product. Um, of course, I'm happier now that I got the rug, but um, they exchanged a couple of days later, we were over visiting and grandma Maggie left hand was sitting in the corner kind of dulling up her, her bracelet. And my father was like, oh no, you know, I worked for days shining this thing up. And we asked Maxine because grandma couldn't speak English. She was Navajo. They were Navajo family from Northern Arizona by Kaibato, but had moved down to Douglas for personal reasons. Anyways, so with interpretation from Maxine to grandma, Grandma explained the story when she was a young girl. When she was a young girl, she, she was telling us that um, the soldiers would come to their, their tribes encampments and take everything of value from them to include their regalia, any jewelry, anything that they thought was of value. So grandmother was dulling her bracelet to make it look worthless so that when the soldiers came, they could not take her bracelet, they wouldn't take it. Mm -hmm. So. The reason I tell you that story is because that's our history, some of our history out there. I want everybody to be aware of it and also to know that we are moving on 
and learning from those experiences. I was very honored to hear that story and to meet grandma. Uh, since then, I've been trying to get a couple more of her rugs, but <laughs> the family won't let them go, <laughs> mm. which I understand. Grandma, of course, is no longer with us because that was 50 years ago, <clears throat> but I'm very proud to have her rug. So with that said, a um, little bit of history, uh, like I was saying, the Native American history for me creating a, a Native American celebration day and month long activities is to continue sharing Native American culture and history so that it's not forgotten and that our youth and anybody else out there that wants to learn about it can have it available and that we learn from our past and make the present better and future better. So that's a little bit about what we got going on here um, each month. Unfortunately, typically what we do is we have a Native American celebration day in person. Uh, due to COVID, of course, we cannot have that which means that you all miss out on my fried bread and chili. So, <laughs> sorry about that, maybe next year. Um, okay, moving on, our first speaker, uh, I wanna say that uh, it's been a pleasure working with her so far uh, when she joined the agency. She's always supported the Native American coordinator duties and position, and she's also always supported our Native American Celebration Month activities and our Celebration Day. Everybody, please welcome our state director for South Dakota with rural development, Julie Gross. Well, thank you, Ken. As Ken said, my name is Julie Gross and I'm honored to serve as the state director of USDA rural development in South Dakota. And I wanna welcome you to our virtual Native American Celebration Day. Um, as Ken said, we've been hosting one in Huron for, well, he has for over 10 years and we've always had some good food and great fellowship. So that is missed, but there are some benefits as our, this is our first virtual event. We're able to be, reach more staff who couldn't travel to Huron. And we're also able to record this event for those who aren't able to join. So we appreciate your participation today and thank you for joining. And I'd like to express a big thank you to Ken Lynch. He's our Native American coordinator. So thank you, Ken, for organizing today's event. And as you know, Ken has been sharing video clips this month, which helps us to learn about the culture. And he also created a, a quiz for the staff. So thank you, Ken. So since 1990, South Dakotans have been celebrating Native American Day in October and Native American Heritage Month in November. It's a time we can celebrate rich and diverse cultures, traditions, and histories to acknowledge the important contributions of Native Americans. And personally, I love learning more about the Native American culture. There are stories that are passed from generation to generation, the dancing, the traditions. These are things that I can't share with my own children about my heritage because I don't have it. So I'm in awe of that culture and it's wonderful to see these traditions continue. So personally, I love this time of year and all year when we can um, celebrate. Hopefully next year we can actually go to some in-person um, powwows. So at USDA, we have a long-standing tradition of a strong partnership with the Native Americans. Rural Development, FSA, and NRCS work in all nine reservations in South Dakota. And in the past three years, I've witnessed several positive impacts on the reservations that I am sure will reap benefits for many years to come. And there are just a few projects that I wanna mention today that happened um, this fiscal year. Um, in Kyle, South Dakota, American Indian Running Strong, they received a community facilities grant and they purchased a garden tractor and a pickup truck. And there are 63 students enrolled in their gardening classes. And this project is gonna give them the ability to prepare their gardens, distribute their foods locally, and meet the high demands for local produce. And so I just think that's a wonderful project. And at Lower Brule, the Boys and Girls Club, they were able to purchase a 12 passenger van with a community facilities trans, um, grant. And as you know, transportation is vital um, to a club and, and providing safe transportation is even more important. And the Rosebud Sioux Tribe installed a geothermal heating system at the health care center located in White River. They had been using a propane boiler system for heat and that used over 10,000 gallons of propane a year. So this new heating system will provide efficiency, it'll save money, and it'll definitely benefit the nursing home residents. 
and tribal college grants. This year, Sintagleska, Oglala Lakota College, and Sisseton Wapaton received funding for equipment, lighting, HVAC repairs, and upgrades to their buildings. And on Cheyenne River, the Four Bands Community Fund, they received a rural business enterprise grant to assist 10 small and emergency and emergency emerging businesses on the Cheyenne River Reservation. They provide technical assistance through training. And also on Cheyenne River, our most recent project was the Minnewasta Water Company. And that is a tribal, tribally chartered entity formed in the um, 70s, and it serves 14,000 members. Um, which is kind of a rarity to have that. And it serves nearly two thirds of the Cheyenne Sioux Reservation, Dewey and Zeebot counties. And it is such a, it covers such a large area that you could say that the area that they service is the size of the state of Connecticut. And they received a loan and a grant um, for over $32 million. And they are gonna upgrade, do some upgrades to the, to service the community of Timber Lake, and they will um, be providing water to the entire reservation. And currently there are customers in this area who have to haul drinking water. So that's another great project that RD is very excited to partner with. And then another project I wanna mention that wasn't in 2020, but it's um, a, a great project. It's a pilot, it's a 502 relending housing pilot. It began in 2018. And it was launched with two community development financial institutions, Mazaska on the Pine Ridge Reservation and Four Bands on the Cheyenne River Reservation. And this pilot is allowing those two CDFIs to loan 502 direct program funds to eligible single family home buyers to provide mortgages on tribal trust lands. And this was a big step for rural development. This was over four years in the making and it took the congressional help from Senator Thune, Senator Rounds and then Congressman Nome to get this done. Um, it's a pilot, like I said, it's going well and I'm just really proud of the work that Mazaska and Four Bands are doing to fill this housing need. In October, and on October 30th of this year, President Trump declared November 2020 as National Native American Heritage Month. And I would like to read the entire proclamation, but in the essence of time, I'm just gonna give you a few highlights from that proclamation. The Trump administration has taken unprecedented action to promote the health and well-being of Native American communities. With the CARES Act funding, which is, stands for Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, they have provided $8 billion to ensure Native American communities have the resources they need to combat the virus. And the Great American Outdoors Act, which was signed into law earlier this year, it was the largest conservation effort in a generation. And it, had, it included up to $475 million in guaranteed funding over the next five years to improve American Indian school infrastructure. Um, the administration also secured from Finland a number of cultural artifacts and human re remains originating in the Mesa Verde region. And the president has committed to continue working on identifying Native American artifacts wrongfully taken abroad. And then you may have heard about this in our local news in South Dakota, but Operation Lady Justice. This initiative addresses the long ignored tragedy of missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Native people. They have opened seven cold case offices in the US and the second one to open was in Rapid City. And at the opening of this office in Rapid City, I don't know if any of you know Jeannie Hovland, she is the commissioner of the administration of Native Americans and she's also a member of the Flandreau Santee Sioux tribe. And at that opening, she discussed keeping the national crisis of missing and murdered Native Americans as a priority and improving the prevention, intervening for those in crisis and supporting the individuals, the families in the communities that are definitely in need of healing. Native Americans play a critical role in the health and vitality of our great nation. During National Native American Heritage Month, we honor these vibrant cultures as business owners, artists, teachers, writers, courageous members of our armed forces like we're gonna hear from today, and so much more. 
Their contributions to our society are cause for celebration and appreciation by all Americans. This month, as we honor the heritage of the Native American tribes and people, we resolve to support their legacy and communicate in communities for generations to come. So please take this opportunity today, all month, all year, to learn more about this rich culture, their heritage, and the contributions that they continue to provide. And thank you, I will turn it back over to Ken. Thank you, Julie. Um, our next speaker, our guest speaker, um, I hope you've all had a chance to read his bio. I'm not going to read it. Um, I would like to introduce him a different way. Uh, Danny Garceau is not only a Native American brother of mine, he's also a uh, military veteran brother. He's a father, he's a grandfather, he's a teacher. Uh, Danny is, is a friend, he's become a friend over the years, and he's also taken on responsibility to teach and pass on Native American culture and history to his family and everybody else that he comes in contact with. I want you to please welcome Danny J. Garceau. I'm a glitch, Niji. Wabashiji Megan, Indigena Kaz, Migazi, Indo Dim, Ispermin in Dojaba, in Anishinaabe, Wikwadang, Ogichida, Danny J. Garceau, Chi Mokiman, Indigena Kaz. It's customary uh, when we present. Uh, to present ourselves in our, our, the language of our ancestors, Anishinaabewin or Ojibwewin, uh, depending on, on what you call it. And, and I introduced myself saying he is a gray wolf. It's a name that was given to me by an elder up at Red Cliff. Um, and he must have known I was going to turn into a gray wolf because he must have seen that when he gave me my name many years ago. Um, but I also said I'm, I'm part of the, the Eagle Clan. Uh, which is the clan that was assigned to uh, the mixed marriages, those uh, uh, Native Americans that, uh, Native Americans, uh, women who married uh, the French traders. And so they put them in, in the Eagle Clan, which was a uh, kind of like the Loon Clan. It's all part of the Bird Clan, uh, but they were used kind of like the intermediates to work between, uh, to work between uh, the Native community and also the French uh, trading community. And so that's the clan that my ancestors were put in and that I, I fall into. And then I said, I live in Ishpermin, which is a small town, which also happens to be an Ojibwa word, which means heaven or high place. So I live up in the highlands on the southern shores of Lake Superior. Um, and then I, I said that I'm, I'm a member of the, the, the Kiwana Bay Indian Community a Veteran uh, Society. And I also said that my American name is Danny J. Garso. So that was my introduction uh, that I did before I speak. And, and I do that every time I speak, as I mentioned, to honor my ancestors. But something else that, that I've started to do and been doing for several years is to acknowledge the land that we're on. And uh, the land that we're on is, is very important to us, uh, indigenous people. And uh, normally I, I, I honor the land uh, in the language of the place that I'm speaking, but because we're speaking across the country right now, I just like to, to acknowledge the land uh, that we're on. Uh, people think of Indian country sometimes as South Dakota or Oklahoma, but actually Indian country is from the east coast where the sun rises to the west coast where it sets to the far north uh, to, to where the Arctic Circle, uh, uh, where the Arctic Circle is down to the south where we, we border the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so, so Indian country is all of that and I just like to acknowledge that that when you think of Indian country, uh, think of it as everything that encompasses where we live here on Turtle Island. Um, I'd also uh, like to, to thank Ken for everything that he does, for inviting me here, but also for everything that he does uh, to bring a Native American uh, heritage and culture uh, to the USDARD. And Julie, also you working in the department, I wanna thank you too for supporting Ken and, and everything that he does. And I am missing that that chili and fry bread. I remember being there five years ago or so, and and that was some really good fry bread and chili. You do a good job with that, kid. And and for those that don't know, uh, most uh, Native Americans that make fry bread, they always think their fry bread is the best, or at least their moms or grandmas is. The family fry bread <laughs> is is a sense of pride. Uh, and fry bread, if you weren't aware of it, is something that that's not indigenous food. 
It's something that was adopted by Native Americans because when they were given uh, the commodities of, of lard and flour and salt, uh, they needed to do something with it and they, they learned how to make bread or and by instead of baking it, they would fry it and that's where fry bread came about. And, uh, and then it became widespread across all of, of, uh, all of uh, Indian country uh, because they were all getting the same commodities and they were all making their own version of this fry bread. Anyway, I want to tell you uh, that there's a lot of diversity in Native America. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in the way that we look. There's a lot of diversity in the way that our cultures, a lot of diversity in, in our own personal stories or our, our tribal community stories. There is a common thread through all of them though. And uh, we all share that common thread uh, and, and are, are related in one way or another but there are all, also all diversity and individual. So if you learn about the Native American culture in uh, South Dakota, it may not be the same Native American culture that you would find in the Southwest or in Texas or the Southeast or the Northeast or the Great Lakes or in the Northwest or up in, in, in Alaska. Each one of those communities have their own culture and their own histories. Uh, that, that they share uh, with their community. And so uh, it's good to learn the cultures, but also be aware that there's different cultures around. And you're very blessed in, in South Dakota where you're at because there is so much history there, so much culture and reservations and, and many things to go see uh, where you can learn more. I know when I was coming back from Colorado this year, uh, I made sure that, that I drove through uh, Champlain so I could stop at the Dignity statue, which is an amazing statue uh, of, of a, a native woman dancing overlooking the Missouri River. Just a very beautiful spot and a very beautiful culture uh, right next to the Lewis and Clark uh, uh, Museum or, or display that they have there at the rest stop. So uh, there's many things to see in South Dakota and I hope that you do seek them out or wherever you're at in the country, you look up to see what tribes are in the area and what cultural centers might be in the area so that you can learn about the culture in that in that particular region you're going to be in. Uh, something that, that's on the rise is Native American tourism and, and uh, there's an organization called NATO, Native American Tourism Organization, uh, that if you're ever traveling somewhere or want to find out more information about the region you're going to, you can probably start there and they, they might be able to point you in the right direction. But I also wanted to tell about my own personal story, just like Ken did. Uh, uh, we're a, a people that, that learn and share with story. Uh, many of our histories, uh, before we started writing them down, uh, were all oral histories. And the same thing with our family stories. Uh, they're, they're stories that, that we have as we grow up. Very much like Ken, he was, he was 12 years old when he had that moment uh, where he started to realize his culture and his belonging in that culture. Uh, for me, I, I grew up away from the reservation. Uh, my great grandmother uh, many years ago moved away uh, from the reservation uh, because of jobs. Uh, and she married a French Canadian Métis, which was a Canadian, French Canadian and native mix. And uh, he was a, a shipbuilder. And so he was in the, the lumber industry. And when shipbuilding kind of died out in the Red Cliff area, uh, he got into the lumber business just like many people did. There was a lumber yard right there at Red Cliff uh, where, the, where the casino is now. They actually left some of, the, some of the pilings there from the docks that were there so that people can still see a little bit of that history. But he moved on. He got into the lumber business too and moved away from Red Cliff uh, to where bigger lumbering jobs were opening up. Down, at first it was uh, Le Couture and Bad River, and then over to Ontonagon, Upper Michigan, and in a community called Rockland, there was a native community there. And so they moved there and he worked in the lumber business. And as they moved there because of discrimination, um, my great grandmother never enrolled any of her children. And so, and so, and she also encouraged them to just blend in. It was much easier to be thought of as a French Canadian immigrant than it was to be thought of as a Native American back then. Uh, uh, discrimination was very heavy, uh, very heavy back then. And she did what was best for the family. And uh, so she didn't enroll any of her kids. Uh, she didn't, you know, she told them the stories of the family and everything, but she didn't raise them as you would consider being raised as Native. Now, 
two generations later, my father raised me. And although he always let me know who I was and where we came from, uh, he didn't have that cultural knowledge, but he did have that, that thread inside of him uh, to where he taught me about the forest, the land, the water, respecting it, using it. And he had those things that, that he taught me. Uh, but I didn't grow up going to powwows. I didn't grow up uh, uh, doing those things that, that I enjoy doing now. But while I was serving in the military, um, at, at about 20 years in, and I became a sergeant major, I had an opportunity to serve on a, on a diversity council. And when I served on that diversity council, uh, they were looking for a Native American septum. And, uh, and I volunteered. I volunteered for it because I wanted to learn more. And through that duty I had in the, the military actually started me on my journey of finding my culture, of re reuniting my family back with where they came from. And that's a journey I've been on now for, for over 15 years, uh, learning the culture um, and, and also connecting my family back, back, uh, uh, black, back to the Lake Superior Chippewas of Red Cliff, Bad River and Lacouta Ray, Kiwana Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, um, Bay Mills, Lock View Desert, uh, uh, Skokagan, Mole Lake, uh, Lock Du Flambeau. We have many Lake Superior Chippewa reservations along this southern shore of, of Lake Superior, Gitchigumi. And so I, I, of course, being a veteran, served in a color guard, native color guard. I had many mentors and elders that helped me uh, learning stories, uh, learning, learning uh, the history uh, of our people, and, and then also becoming able to where I could share it with others. And so I've been actually sharing what I've learned as I continue to learn, uh, as I continue to learn. And some of my elders have now passed away this, this year. COVID took two of our, our Ogichida, our veteran elders, uh, out of our organization. And, and more and more, uh, we're being leaned on, that next generation of elders, uh, to tell those stories and to mentor uh, the young folks as they come up and to remind them where they come from, to remind them of the culture and the importance of it. And so those are things that, that I've been learning. Along with that, uh, I had the opportunity, um, I had the opportunity to go to a presentation at Northern Michigan University about 10 years ago. Uh, their Native American Studies program uh, was having a, a, a person come in by the name of Keith Sokola. And at the time I just knew he was a musician. I had never really heard much about him, but I knew he was a musician, but he came in and he was the, the entertainment that night. And him and his band of, uh, he was called the Wild uh, Band of Indians, was his band that he brought with him. And they played some rock and roll uh, Native American Americana. And, and it, was, it was very good, very good. Uh, and, and I come to find out years later that, you know, he's a legend. Uh, he became a friend and I found out he's a legend. He, he's been artist of the year several times, producer of the year. Uh, he's in the, the Native American Music the Hall of Fame. Uh, he's played with, with a lot of the big artists that you might be more aware of, you know, whether it's Tom Petty, uh, the Grateful Dead, Neil Young. Uh, there's many of those people that he's played with that they've asked him to come in and play the guitar or sing or maybe play the flute. But anyway, the next day I was also invited to sit in with the students. And so I sat in a, with the students and he was the guest speaker that day. And he wanted to talk about the flute. And so he had a flute there with him and he talked about the flute, about how he, uh, about how the flute came about as far as his knowledge and what the flute meant. And, and the message that he was trying to give the students was that everybody can play the flute and that you should pick up a flute and learn how to play it because there'd be more peace in the world if you played a flute because it's hard to have angry thoughts when you're playing a flute. So that kind of motivated me and I had had a flute that I picked up at a actually an Indian trading post that was going out of business and so I picked up this flute off the wall before you know before it went out of business but I never tried to play it but when I went home that day I, I, I learned how to I, I picked it up and I, I remember those few tips he told me on how to play the flute and I played it and it actually made sound that didn't sound horrible. It actually sounded kind of good. So that encouraged me to, to play more and learn more about the flute. And so uh, I've always uh, credited my flute playing uh, to Keith Sokola and the sharing of his story and the message that he had. 
Um, and so that was, uh, I'd say that was about seven, eight years ago is when I started playing the flute. Um, yeah, maybe it's been 10 years ago. When, when I get older, when I say two, three years, it normally means six, seven years, normally double what I say. It's normally what more realistic is what I'm finding. But, but I've been playing it for a while. I've been playing it for, let's say, 10 years. And it started off with that one flute that I got. Uh, and I'm going to stand up. That one flute that I got from from a long time ago and I actually it's a it's a simple cedar flute uh simple cedar flute and I've had uh I've had uh Keith Sokola sign it you know like I said became friends and years later we were playing I said Keith this is the first flute I got you're the one that actually motivated me to start playing and and asked him to sign it and he did for me so so that's my little keepsake uh, with that flute but since then flutes uh, are kind of like grandchildren and, and you, they just kind of multiply. And so it all started with this one flute here. And I, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm probably up to 17 grandchildren now when it comes to my flutes. I only have one real grandchildren, but I got 17 flute grandchildren. And each one of them is different. Uh, the, the, the flute can be different based on the wood that it's made, uh, based on the spacing of the holes, uh, based on the thickness of the flute, uh, uh, and also the, the length of the flute. Although no sound comes out the end of the flute, it all comes up up by the nest uh, or the fetish. Uh, uh, the length of the flute also adds sound because the sound comes comes through and down and up through the holes then that are right there. And so, so they all sound a little bit different uh, and they all come in different keys. And uh, I, I know that uh, Ken mentioned about everything is a circle. Uh, in my bio, it says I play for a group called Wawiea and uh, that and that means circle in a, in Anishinaabe and it is Wawea. And we say we're a circle because uh, our band is kind of fluid. We're we're a we're a, an indigenous rock group uh, that plays uh, a wide variety of Americana, but we also have a wide variety of members. We got a core four or five members in the group, but at times we got as many as ten or eleven people in the group, depending if they're available and can come play. And, and so. Uh, so our name, the circle, means everybody's welcome in that circle. And uh, and although I've been playing Native American flute, when when the band asked me to start playing with them, um, I learned I've been learning more about how the flute can be played differently than what you might consider in Native ways. As I mentioned, uh, Keith Sokola told me about the story uh, that he shared about the creation of the flute. And uh, the Anishinaabe, we, we have stories about everything. We, we tell stories to teach lessons. We tell stories to remind us of our culture. We tell stories to remind us of our history. Uh, and we also tell stories for entertainment too, uh, to, to have a little bit of fun sometimes. Uh, but most of the stories that we tell, um, you know, they have a purpose and they have a purpose. And uh, Storytelling also is something that we normally don't do year round. Uh, normally we don't start storytelling until winter time when the snow is on the ground, when it's cold outside. And, and the reason for that is, is because uh, stories can be very entertaining, uh, but they also take time and they take energy. And, and during all those warm months, whether it's the spring, summer or fall, uh, you know, it was our, our way to make sure that we stayed busy and productive, whether it was fishing, hunting, gathering, uh, making food, storing food, uh, getting, uh, you know, getting things to keep us warm. That's where our energy went, you know, nine months, or I shouldn't say nine months out of the year, because up where we live, winter is about five, six months out of the year. Uh, so, so for more than half of the year, uh, we, we're busy doing other things, so we don't tell a lot of stories. But in the winter time, when the nights are long and the days are short and it's cold outside and, and you're not out there gathering food, that's the time where we'd sit around fires and tell stories. And so it's always remained that tradition. And so now here it is, you know, uh, in November, I definitely got cold weather and snow out on the ground where I'm at. Um, and so now's the time for telling some stories. So I wanted to share that story uh, that Kisa Cola uh, told me about the creation of the flute and then play a little bit of flute for you. 
And the, the story I'm going to tell is all, there's also been a book written about it. It's called The Love Flute. There's many different stories about how the flute came about, but the one I'm going to tell you is, the, is called The Love Flute and how the, how the flute came to the, to, to the native people. Uh, and I'm going to stand up while I do this because sometimes I get a little animated and, and sitting here in the chair, it's just not quite the same. So hopefully you'll see me fine just standing by my chair and it'll be easier for me to grab some flutes to show you too. And I'm hoping the lighting's fine here and, and that the sound comes out all right. Okay, give me a thumbs up, Ken, if, if you can hear me okay. Am I all right? Is my mic loud enough? I would say just... T tilt your camera up a little bit so you can. Ah, okay. Are they cutting off my head? <laughs> Perfect. Is my sound okay? A uh, little muffled, but pretty good. Might, uh, maybe. I, I might have to, I'll, I'll try to come a little bit closer and, and see how that works. That's pretty good. Anyway, a long time ago in a native village, uh, there was a young brave, and that young brave was the fastest in the in the tribe. He was the best hunter. He seemed to be the bravest, always volunteering to do the, the hard things when the hunting party would go out. And everybody knew this young brave was gonna be a future leader of the tribe. Uh, he was everything that every parent, every grandparent would want their, their grandson to be like. Well, also in this, this village was a young maiden. And this young maiden was a beautiful young maiden and she was so caring and had such a great heart. And she was always helping the children. She was always helping her, her, her elders. Uh, she was just, just a very prize of a, a young woman herself. And everybody knew she was gonna be a leader someday. Well, this young, young brave was at that age, probably about 14, 15 years old, where, where young boys start, start to look at young girls and uh, girls are looking at young boys. And although this young brave was the strongest and fastest and the bravest out of all the young boys in the tribe, one thing he couldn't do was get the courage to talk to this maiden that he had an eye for. No matter how much he tried, whenever he'd go to try to talk to her, he would just, he would just freeze up and not be able to say anything. And, and so he'd have to walk away. And he'd watch the other young boys and they would, they would flirt with her, say things and tease her. And she, although wasn't giving them a lot of attention, would giggle at their attempts at, at them to try to gain her attention and affection. And this was starting to bother this young brave to the point to where he couldn't sleep at night. He, all he could think about was how he couldn't talk to this, this young maiden that he wanted, you know, wanted to be with. And so he prayed to Gitche Manadu. He prayed to the creator and he prayed and asked, please give me the courage to, to talk to her. Please help me. Uh, this means so much to me. And after several nights, you know, nothing happened. He still couldn't talk to that maiden. And so one night while he was laying there, not getting any sleep, he hadn't slept in, in, in weeks, a really good night's sleep. He decided it's probably best for him to leave the tribe so that he doesn't have to look at this maiden every day and torment him how he can't talk to her. And so he got up very early that morning before anybody else did in the village and he grabbed his bow and his arrow and his, his little sack with some, some food and some water in it. And he went out his wigwam and just kind of looked up and took an arrow and shot it in the air, figuring wherever that arrow goes, that's the direction I'm gonna walk and I'm gonna just keep walking till I can't walk any farther. Well, when he brought that bow back, and he shot it up in the air. When it left his bow, it went up about seven feet, eight feet in the air, but then just leveled out and hung there and pointed in a direction. He thought this was strange, but back then there was a much greater connection with the creator and, and things you believe that he was more involved in your life. And he figured it was the creator talking to him. So he walked in the direction of that arrow and he walked all day. And as he walked, that arrow just stayed right out in front of him, floating about seven feet from the air. And he walked all day. He walked over rivers. He walked through, through valleys, through forests. And at the end of the day, when the sun was setting, the arrow dropped and he figured, oh, this must be where I'm going to rest. And so he unpacked his things, his bedroll, uh, had a little bit to drink, a, a little bit to eat, and he laid down and went to sleep. 
When he woke up the next morning, he grabbed his arrow and bow again and shot it in the air. And again, that arrow hung there pointing in a direction. So he continued to walk that day, walking all day long, again, crossing rivers around lakes, just following that arrow. Now he could, as I mentioned, going around lakes. For a minute, I thought I said walking across lakes. Then we'd be telling a different story, like Jesus or something like that. But, but <laughs> this was a young warrior instead. So he walked around lakes following that arrow. Wherever that arrow pointed, he just followed it. Again, at the end of the day, that arrow fell to the ground. He rolled out his bedroll, had a little bit to eat, a little bit to drink, and he went to sleep. He did this for three days, the same thing, over and over repeating itself. And on the fourth day, at the end of the day, the arrow came down, he unrolled his bedroll, had something to eat, a little bit to drink, and went to sleep. Well, this night while he was sleeping, he was awoke, awakened in his sleep, and there standing off to the side were these two big elk, these big elk with big antlers on their heads. And in their antlers were all these shining things, like shining beads and silver, uh, uh, silver objects and stuff, kind of like looking like Christmas trees. Uh, they were just very special big elk men that were there, and they were arguing. I don't know how many of you have seen the, the, the show Brother Bear, uh, the animated one, but there's two moose in there and they're arguing. You talk to them. No, you talk to them. You talk to them. No, you talk to them. And these elk men are doing that, arguing about who's going to go talk to this Indian brave. And finally, the two elk, as they're arguing, notice that he's standing there looking at them. And so as, as they see him, look, say, well, we better go talk to him. And so they go over to him and they say, the creator has heard your prayers and he asked all of us, all the animals to get together to help you in your, in your request to be able to, to speak with the young maiden in your tribe. And so what he's done is he's asked the trees, the cedar tree to give up a branch. And he asked a woodpecker to come and peck holes in that branch and so that it'll create noise. And he asked all the woods, all the land, the water, all the birds and animals to put their voices into that branch so that when you play it, you will play the voices of the woods and of your brothers and sisters uh, of the animals and birds. And they, so he said, and he showed them. And it looked very similar to this, just a piece of wood, piece of wood with holes pecked in it, holes on both ends. And, and a little fetish on top, and they gave it to him. And he was looking, as he was looking down at this flute, there was a flash of light. A light must have shined off of one of the shiny things from the Elkman, and it just kind of like blinded. But when he got his vision back, they weren't there anymore. There was nothing there, it was just dark. The woods was dark. And so he put the flute down, and he laid back down and fell back to sleep. The next morning when he woke up, he was looking at, he was thinking, man, that was a strange dream. I haven't had a dream like that in a long time. That was so strange. And then as he looked down to pick up his stuff to get going to shoot his bow again, there laying on the ground was that branch with the holes in it. And he remembers what the elk men told him about blowing into it and that there'd be voices from all the animals in that. And they had given him more instruction on that about to listen to the animals, to listen to the different things and try to mimic it on the flute. And so he picked it up and, and he started to blow into it. And he tried lifting his fingers a little bit to see what that would do. And he heard a noise, a noise that he's never heard before. He's never heard a flute before, but it sounded good to him. And he was very excited. He remembered what the elk men told him. They told him this was a gift from the creator and from all his brothers and sisters, the animals and birds. And he remembered that he was supposed to listen to the different things and to try to mimic it and put it in the flute. So he got real excited that this was going to be a powerful tool and it was going to help him get that maiden. So he packed up his stuff and he started walking back to the tribe. And as he started to walk back to his community, he was listening to everything. He was listening to the water 
running over the rocks and the rivers. He was listening to the wind blowing through the trees and the leaves. He was listening to the songbirds with their high pitches and the melodies of the robin, the opichi. And he was also listening to the bigger birds and their cause. And he was listening to the other animals and he was trying to mimic them. And as he was walking, he was playing the flute, learning these things. He was learning these things the whole time. Remember, he walked four days to get where he had that dream. So it took him four days, even walking fast, to get back to where he was at. But on the fourth day, he got there before the end of the day. And he was sitting up on a high ground, looking down at the village. And as he's looking down at the village, he can see all the people in the village. But he also sees the maiden there outside of her wigwam. And he, he's, he had practiced now, so he was going to use this tool and play or something. So he put it to his mouth and started to play. When the people heard this sound, again, none of them have ever heard a flute before. They were amazed. They thought it was wonderful. But it went right to the heart of that maiden, and she knew that that song was for her. And so she left her wigwam and walked up the side of the hill and stood next to the young brave. And he continued to play for her, but it gave him the strength with her next to him and him playing that he was finally being able to talk to her also. And like any good story, they ended up getting together later in life and had many children and many grandchildren afterwards. But that was the story about how the flute came to the Anishinaabe. It was an answer to a prayer from a young brave uh, that needed some courage or a tool to help to speak to that young lady. Now, it looks like I only got a few minutes left, but I wanted to, to show you a few other flutes I got just to tell you uh, a little bit of difference with them. So I mentioned that one right there was a was a flute made by an uh, Anishinaabe man on the northern shore of Lake Huron. He finds branches that blow up or that drift up on the shore, and he he finds the right ones and makes flutes out of them. But I have many other flutes here too, and some of them vary in size. There's some of them that are very small, like this one here that has more like a bird sound. in the key of G. And this one right here also is in the key of G, but you can see it's much larger and made out of a different wood. Are some that are very, very large. They, this is called a bass flute. You can see it's it's got a much bigger bow inside of it to give it a lower tone. 
but they even make some that are much longer and bigger that are even got deeper voices. make some real fancy ones that are called drone flutes that have more than one flute connected together at the end and they make drone flutes and they actually make some that are triple flutes but this is what a drone flute si sounds like and you can see there's two holes in the end so you can play one or the other or at the both at the same time So there's many different flutes out there. I'm gonna play one last one for you, see if you can tell the difference. This, those ones right there are all been tuned in what they call concert tuning. This one right here has been tuned, which is called earth tuning. Uh, and it's one that it, it's more connected with the earth. And so it's a little bit off from the, from the other ones, but you know, unless you're, unless you're a, a musician, it's very hard to tell the difference. And I can't, but maybe some of you out there might be able to tell the difference between this flute and the other ones. Well, those are some of my grandchildren, some of my grandchildren flute anyway. And uh, I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to take up too much time uh, with that, but I wanted to tell you a story. I wanted to show you some of the flutes. And, and, and before, I, before I turn this back over to Ken, I just wanted to make a quick pitch for the organization that I've been serving with for 15 years, the Society of American Indian Government Employees. And I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. It looks like I can. Is my screen being saved? Can you see a, a, a poster there? Yes. Yes. All right, very good. This is a, the Society of American Indian Government Employees is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. It's non-political, it's not a union one, but it's an organization for all government employees, uh, whether it's federal, state, tribal, local, uh, government contractors, military. We have members from all those different areas. Uh, we're the only national organization that does that. And uh, we've been around since uh, um, 2002 is when we first started. And uh, we've been having an annual training program uh, where we share our culture and share those things to help with professional development of Native American, all government employees, but we, we blend a lot of Native American culture uh, into our, our national training programs. Uh, our mission is to, to increase the number of American Indian Alaska Natives in government because in so many uh, of the government agencies, they're underrepresented. USDA does a pretty good job with it, um, but and of course BIA and Indian Health Services do too. Uh, but other than those three organizations, uh, most of the other ones are, are very underrepresented. So, so we're trying to, to make awareness and uh, in those agencies and in the government 
uh, to hire more American Indian Alaska natives, and then also to retain them and help them get promoted and get into leadership positions. Uh, we have a youth program, we have a veterans program. Both of those are, are some of the tools we have to, to help with that too. But as you see here, every uh, year we post, uh, we make a poster, we have a theme and a poster. And this year it was sovereignty is sacred, sharing our rights and culture. And so, so that, that was good that, that you know, we are able to share some of our stories and some of our culture this month, because uh, that was our theme too. Oh, it says I'm sharing screen, but I can't, I, I, I get it now. I can't forward it. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get out of share screen and then move on to the next one. Okay. I'm back on here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the other ones I had on there, I had a few other uh, slides on there. I'm just going to talk about them briefly. Uh, one of them was my contact information, uh, which I'll try to put on after I'm done speaking. Uh, I'll, I'll try to put it up on, on my screen uh, so that people can get a hold of me, whether it's through email or phone call. Yes. Uh, I am a director with the Society of American Indian Government Employees. Uh, and I'm also uh, the director of the Warrior Society, which is our veteran organization uh, with, this, uh, with SAGE, Society of American Indian Government Employees. But I also want to encourage everybody to go out there, learn more about Native American Heritage Month. Ken put out a great, a great trivia uh, contest out there. I hope you all got them right and you're in that drawing for one of his beautiful pieces of art. Um, but there are a lot of ways to discover it. Right now, if you're on an Amazon Prime member, uh, they have a, a category just for Native American Month where there, there's a couple dozen different documentaries and feature films that deal with the culture and history of Native Americans. So it's, it's a great place to go. I don't know if it'll be up there all year, but it's up there this month to where they categorized it. And you can go and pick movies there. Um, so with that, uh, continue to learn. Again, Chi McGwitch, big thank you, Ken. And also to you, Julie, and your department. Um, and just, uh, I hope that, uh, that we are able to come and share some of that fry bread and chili sometime whether it's uh, for a presentation or if I'm just passing through your area. <laughs> that means I got to cook if you show up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure to have you as our guest or just as a drop by as a family visit. Um, I know my mother uh, loves seeing you and, and your grandson, and uh, we hope to see you soon. I think that uh, Julie's got a small token from the agency for yeah. you. Um, so go ahead, Julie. Before well, we start that, do we want to do questions or? Well, oh, was... yeah, yeah. If okay. there are, are there some questions? I have one, and it is: Has your flute playing led you to play other instruments? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I, I picked up a guitar many years ago too, hmm. thinking that someday I'll start playing guitar. That has not happened. <laughs> However, playing it, playing in Wawiea because I play the flute and I try not to play the flute all the time. I try to play it about, eh, about 60% of the time. It opens me up to have some free time. So, so I've kind of picked up the cowbells, mm. picked up the cowbells. And then another instrument we've been using is a little, little central, central American hollow toad. Mm. You can make, so it's a percussion instrument, and I also do the rattle, Native American rattle. So just a few percussion instruments are the only other things I've picked up. I, I do drum and sing with a drum group also, uh, but I, I don't consider that playing an instrument, so. Hmm. Thank you. Tammy, were there other questions? That was the only one I received. If there's any others, you can put them in your chat box and we'll get them asked. Okay. Great. Well, Danny, thank you for this. Well, first, I want to just say thank you for your service. As a Sergeant Major, um, I read your whole history. You have a very impressive history. So thank you for your service in the And thank you for sharing your story today about the flute, the love flute. Um, when you played the flute, it made me re realize and remember, actually, how relaxing Native American music is. Uh, gosh, it's been over 20 years ago. The band Brulee, which are 
pretty popular. They were at Augustana College in Sioux Falls, and I went to see them, and it was wonderful. I bought their CD, and I've since then bought other CDs, and I don't listen to CDs very often anymore, but you've inspired me to get them back out because it's a very relaxing, so thank you. Um, you know, I think you've enlightened us all today. Um, it's a pleasure to, to um, learn about your history and how you didn't grow up hearing these stories, but how you've embraced it in the last 15 years. I think that's awesome. And thank you also for the tip. I wrote it down. I am an Amazon Prime member, and I do love documentaries. So I am going to go on and see if I can um, watch some of those movies. So thanks for that tip. And we have a certificate of recognition that we're going to be um, mailing to you. Um, I'm sorry that we can't see you face to face, but hopefully um, we we can meet face to face sometime and share some of that chili and that fry bread. But the certificate is a certificate of recognition, and it reads to Danny J. Garceau for sharing and fostering a deeper understanding and appreciation for the diversity of culture and history of Native Americans. In November and every month, we celebrate the culture and heritage of remarkable Americans like you who deeply enrich the quality and character of the nation. Thank you for sharing and celebrating with us. And Thank you so very much. Thank you. And, great. Yes. And Ken, I will turn it back over to you. All righty, that fried bread, I don't know about the invite for everybody that's on the call, but <laughs> <laughs> if you show up, I guess I got to cook. <laughs> so uh, again, uh, just to mention the SAGE uh, organization, I was able to participate in the SAGE trainings in Anchorage, Alaska a few years back. It was an awesome training. You get to see uh, Native Americans from all the different agencies and, and you know, talk with them and network and, and you really get to know more about Native American culture, which Danny said, it might not be the same uh, in South Dakota that it is in, on my reservation. There's little differences here and there, but in general, they all kind of believe the same thing, which is family. Uh, and that's kind of where I think it, it, it encompasses or starts is with family. And that's why I introduced Danny as family, because he really is part of my family. And it's always a pleasure to talk to him. So um, that's about all I have. If there's no more questions, um, that's about it for today. I really appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, be safe out there in this crazy COVID world. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you all again. And if you haven't filled out your trivia, get it turned in, because I got to I, I sent a picture of the prize, so I'd like to have uh, as many entries as we can to see what kind of knowledge is out there. And, and even if you don't know it, you know, uh, it's good to see it, and then you'll get the answers, and you'll now have some new knowledge. So thank you all. Thank you, Julie, for supporting this. Thanks, Tammy, for mm -hmm. setting it all up. Um, we'll see you next year.